Hello, history friends. Here at the Fernie Museum, we have approximately 10,000 photographs in our archives. Some have been lovingly cared for, kept flat and out of the elements in albums and envelopes. Others have not. Today, we are looking after three long format photographs, which have been tightly rolled for several decades. Ideally, we would like to unroll the photographs and store them on a flat surface, but not so fast. The paper and the photographic emulsion on its surface are dry and brittle, so we can't just crush them flat without doing even more damage to the image than there already is. What we need is to get the paper nice and relaxed. This calls for a lovely, calming spa treatment in our state-of-the-art humidification chamber, a Tupperware bin with a metal grid tied to the sides with string. We fill the bottom chamber with room temperature water from our cutting-edge hydration delivery receptacle, suspend the photographs above the water, close the lid, and let them sit until the paper absorbs enough moisture to chill out a little. Now that the paper is just ever so slightly floppy, but definitely not actually wet, we can unroll it without damaging the image, weigh it down, and see what's inside. Two are identical prints of the same photograph. These are a group portrait of Coal Creek World War I volunteers in uniform, mustering at Vernon in 1916. The other is a panoramic view of Fernie taken with a fisheye lens facing west, taken in 1911. As you can see, stress from being tightly rolled has started to form large cracks up the middle of the photographs, which if left untreated will eventually split the paper in half. There is also tearing and fragmentation at the edges that need to be repaired. To do that, we're going to take our relaxed paper and we're going to let it sit under weight for a while so that it doesn't attempt to re-roll itself while I'm working on it. Humidification does tend to swell the paper fibers and that means that unfortunately some dirt is going to adhere to the paper more easily, but in this case we can't do anything until the paper is flat-ish, so it's a risk that we're willing to take. The first thing we do is carefully clean the back of the photograph, using what most people use to take smudges off of paper, a white vinyl eraser. You can also use those little white latex makeup sponges, or if you want to be very, very delicate, you can grate the vinyl eraser into little tiny crumbs and then rub them over the surface. This paper is in pretty good shape, so we're just going to give it a gentle massage. So, um, just a quick editor's note here on gloves. Not everyone who handles old things feels the need to wear gloves. A lot of people just make sure that their hands are nice and freshly washed before they touch anything. That is because the gloves in some cases can actually hinder your ability to feel whether or not you are doing damage to an object, or in some cases it can make you drop the object. I have been blessed with unusually sweaty hands and so I am wearing the gloves to protect the paper from my digits. We clean it not only because it looks pretty and helps the paper to last longer, but also so that we can avoid gluing dirt to the back when we repair any tears or holes, which we are going to do now. For repairs, we use very thin, very fibrous Japanese paper and a glue made of water and wheat starch. This wheat starch is pre-cooked, so we just mix it with cool distilled water and then we sieve it to get out as many lumps as possible to make a nice, smooth papier-mâché paste. Now this may seem like a lot of trouble just to produce the same stuff that you used to smear on balloons in grade three, but we use the wheat starch and paper combination because one, it's reversible. When another museum employee comes along in 75 years and finds my handiwork lacking, they'll easily be able to take it off and either redo it or do something better and more futuristic, probably with lasers. Two, in a clean and dry environment, it won't eventually degrade and react with the paper or the storage material the way other things do. We will get into this later. To cut the Japanese paper, we actually score it and then tear it into long strips. The tearing part is important to get a nice ragged edge. That way it will blend into the paper that it's applied to. 
Then we take the strips, we wet them with a small amount of glue, and we gently brush them on over the tears. Now that we've repaired as much as we can, we need to dry it under weight to avoid the paper buckling or waving as it dries. This we do with a layer of unwoven polyester fabric. This stuff has all sorts of grades and names and all sorts of uses in conservation, and it is also handy for keeping moths off your cabbages. Next, we top our layer of polyester with a sheet of heavy blotting paper to absorb the moisture, and then a couple of big old boards to weigh it down, like a delicious history baklava. Then we leave it to dry. Our next subject is our panorama of Fernie, and aside from the big crack down the middle, it has a little bit of damage at either end. Now the back doesn't look too dirty. The marks are mostly just age and a spot where somebody apparently used it as a coaster. But wait, what's that? No, no, it's, it's scotch tape! Tape is difficult. Admittedly, it is very good for sticking one thing to another thing. However, over time, the adhesive and backing of most commercially available tapes starts to degrade, either staining or damaging any paper to which it was applied. As you can see, the adhesive on this tape has turned to powder and flaked off a long time ago, but the staining is with us forever. This photograph has been taped together with what appears to be Scotch Magic Tape, which was invented in the 50s and has a matte acetate backing and acrylic adhesive. As you can see, it hasn't started to degrade as badly as other tape documents, but it has already started to turn yellow. And with time, it will only get worse. Luckily, I have a secret weapon. My trusty heat application tool. Suspiciously similar to an ordinary budget hair dryer, this will soften the adhesive, allowing me to carefully get underneath it with a flat metal palette knife. Now that the backing is gone, we can use a vinyl eraser, a scalpel, and a tiny paintbrush with a tiny amount of alcohol to scrape off as much of the remaining adhesive as we can. And then we repair the tears using Japanese paper and starch paste, just like last time. Now that they've been carefully cleaned and repaired, these beautiful photographs will go to their forever home in our flat storage, where they can play with the other large-scale documents, kept safe and sound until the next time they are needed. The end. Thank you for watching Cabinet of Curiosity, and please join us next time.